Hey, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, depending on your time zone. Today we have a very special guest, Chris Webb from Microsoft. I will make a short introduction for myself and uh, for the user group. My name is Salil. I'm a data platform MEP, originally from Turkey, but now uh, living in London. Uh, I'm also an organizer of Power BI Turkey user group. Without further ado, we are all ears, Chris. Thank you for joining me today. It's a privilege. It's a pleasure to be back here. So let me share my screen. go uh hold on it is presenting on the wrong screen let's do that cool all right so thanks for having me i'm chris webb i work at microsoft on the fabric customer advisory team and i'm a big fan of power query the problem with power query though is that it's not really a product on its own it's something you use inside other products like Excel, like Power BI Desktop, like Dataflows, and um, as we'll see, a few other places. So what I wanted to do in this session is just go through all of the things that have changed in the world of Power Query. So if you know how to use Power Query and you're a fan of it like I am, in this session, you'll see all of the things that are new in all of the different places you can use Power Query. And maybe you will see there's a new place where you can use Power Query. So we'll look at Power BI Desktop, uh, the new Power Query experience there. Um, what's happening in Excel, what's happening in Dataflows Gen 2. We'll look at a few language improvements and then we'll finish up with the most exciting thing that I think has happened in Power Query for, the long, for a long time, which is integration with paginated reports. So let's start off with Power BI Desktop. Um, there's not much actually that's new that you will be able to see in Power BI Desktop, but what I have permission to show in this session is the new Power Query experience that's coming into public preview later this year. Now, this new experience is new in Power BI Desktop, but it's actually not really new overall because up till now there have been two code bases, two versions of Power Query in existence. One is the Power Query, the kind of classic Power BI Power Query experience that we've always had in Excel and Power BI Desktop. And then there is the, the web-based experience, Power Query Online, which has been used, for example, in data flows. Now, having two code bases is a bad thing, as you can understand. And the Power Query team want to standardize on the, the new Power Query online code base because that's where all the cool new things are happening. And they are currently working on bringing that into Power BI Desktop. Now, I have a build of Power BI Desktop where I can show this. Uh, you won't be able to do this, but this will show you what's going to happen perhaps later this year. And this is also going to give you all of the latest features that you're all used to, perhaps if you've used Power BI, sorry, Power Query and data flows, but in Power BI Desktop. So I have Power BI Desktop open, and this is a, a blank PBIX file, and I'm going to connect to an Excel workbook and import some data. So I'm going to click on the Excel workbook button here, and immediately we'll start to see new experiences. For example, I've clicked to connect to Excel. Um, this is different from what you might see today. I'm going to browse to this Excel workbook. I'm going to click open, click next. I go to select two tables, which contains some really simple sales data. And I'm going to click on the transform data button here. So this is the new Power Query experience. Now, at the moment, it looks very, very, very similar 
the existing Power Query experience. But if you look hard, there are some obvious changes and improvements. So, for example, we have a look here on the right hand side. You can see we've got step folding indicators. Let me open up, zoom it so that I can zoom in. There we go. So these are things that have been present in data flows. They will be present in Power BI Desktop. I can also switch and turn on diagram view, which again is something you'd be familiar with from um, data flows. And if I merge these two queries, so let's merge them as new, you'll see that I've now got the new merge dialog here with some nice visual representations of all of the different join types you can do. If I click OK, that's my new query showing up here. I've got this. I can do a couple of other things here. So I can go and show the query plan. This Power Query query. And I can also go to switch to schema view. Switch between that and data view. I've also got the script view button at the moment. This just shows the script for the step that I've got selected. If I select a query with a couple of steps in it and go to script, query script, you can see this central pane now has the full query script in it rather than the individual steps. So this is just a taster of what's coming to um, Power, BI, Power BI Desktop later this year when the new Power Query experience gets integrated in. But that's all there is to say about Power BI Desktop. Moving on, we can have a look in Excel. There are a couple of different things to show here. Um, one thing I am not going to be able to show is Power Query for the Mac. Because of course I work for Microsoft and I work with um, Windows machines. I don't want to use a Mac. Um, Power Query for Mac is actually one of those areas that the um, Power Query team have really invested in over the last couple of years. It's getting a lot better. More and more data sources are supported in that. But what I want to do is show you Power Query in Excel on the desktop, Power Query in Excel online, and also look at something called template files, which will lead on to what's next. Let's have a look at Power Query in Excel on the desktop. So I've got Excel here. I'm going to open it up. Let's move this down here. And let's create a new blank workbook. I'm going to connect to those same Excel tables that we showed before. Just again, simple sales data. So really, really simple stuff. We go to from file from Excel workbook. Path. Data. And I'm just going to connect to this producers table. So we connected to this table. It contains some information about products, their categories, and the people that produce them. Now, something that has been around for some time in Excel and is linked to Excel Power Query are Excel data types. Now, this isn't really new. It's been around for a year or two, but there has been one improvement that is fairly new. What's an Excel data type, first of all? Well, here's a table of data. It's data that is all about individual products. I could load this data into my Excel workbook, but here in the Power Query editor, what I can also do, and this is something that's only available in Excel, is select all of these columns, go to transform, and 
select this create data type button. What this does is takes all of the columns in this table that I've selected and it compresses them together into something called an Excel data type. So I'm going to call this data type products. If I go to advanced, you can tell, see that it's got all of these columns in it, and I'm going to click OK. And what it's done in Power Query terms is it's compressed all of this data together into a record. But if I now load this onto the worksheet into a table, you'll see that I've got a table with one column. And this one column has got something interesting. In it. This icon here shows that we've got an Excel data type inside this cell. And now when I've got a cell like this with an Excel data type in it, I can use some Excel functions to get the data out of the data type in a couple of different ways. So one way I can do this is by clicking on a cell like this with apples and clicking on this pop up here to add a column. And I could add producer country, category, and expand like that. We undo that. I can also click here on the icon and see a pop up that shows all of the data. But what I can also you do is use some Excel formulas to get the data out. So if I was to say equals A2, and then you can see I've got all of the attributes of the data type available. So I could say A2 dot category. And there we are. I can get the category that the product is in. There's also function called field value, which does pretty much the same thing. Go, I can use the field value function to extract a value from a data type. So that's something that's been there for quite a long time. That's not new, but what is new is that I can now have nested data types. I can have data types inside data types. So if I delete the Power Query step that created this data type, first of all, what I'm going to do is I'm going to select these three columns, which are columns to do with producers. So I'm going to transform and create data type and call this producers. Click OK. So now I've got a column that contains a data type. And now I can take that plus the product and category columns and create another data type, which we can call products. Click OK. And if I load this, looks the same, first of all. But if I was to say A2 dot producers, I can now use this dot notation to say, well, for A2, give me the producers value for it, and in producers, give me the attribute producer country. There we are, I can extract from that. So I've got this concept of Excel data types and nested ones, which is relatively new. Is this feature available only to Excel, Chris? It's Excel. only in Excel. It's only, only kind of Excel. relevant to Excel. Now, something that's even newer and even more exciting is Python in Excel. So you might, might have heard that you can now do Python and Excel. One of the really interesting things about Python and Excel is that it works quite nicely with Power Query as well. So let's see how. First of all, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new query. And I'm just going to go back to that same Excel file and get the sales table. Yeah. So I've got a Power Query query called sales that brings me back some sales data. Nothing really very interesting. I'm going to click close and load, but I've set this query up so that it just doesn't load. It's a Power Query query, but it is not loaded to the Excel data model. It is not loaded to the worksheet. 
So it is just a Power Query query on its own. The really cool thing is that I can access this Power Query query now in Python. Now, to write Python code in Excel, there are a couple of different ways. Uh, there is a, an insert Python button up here. But if you just do equals and then PY, this creates a Python formula. And if I do open parentheses here, I've now got a special type of cell that contains Python code in it. And I'm going to write a really, really simple single line of Python. Now, inside the Python code here, I can use the Excel function to get it data on an Excel worksheet or get the value from a Power Query query. And there's my sales query that I just created. Now, if I hit Control and Enter to commit this code, query runs. And you can see right now, this cell contains a Python data check, data frame. This is actually very, very similar to an Excel data type. I click on this, you can see the contents of the data frame. And I can now reference this in code. But also, if I go up to here and say, instead of showing the object in the cell, let's switch to show the Excel value, I can get hold of the query results. So now this cell calls my Power Query query and gets the table that that Power Query query returns. And of course, I'm not limited to one line of code here. I can do all kinds of things. And that includes plotting data. So if I replace that line of code with three lines of code, which does the same thing, takes the same table, but plots the data as a bar plot using the Seaborn library, and I hit Control Enter, I'll need to expand the cell a little bit. But there we go. You can now see my Python bar plot returned from a bit of Python code sitting inside a cell in Excel. So Python and Excel, very exciting. And that also works with Power Query as well. There's one other thing to mention while we're here in Excel. There is a fairly easy to ignore new feature. If you go to File, there is an option to export your Power Query queries in Excel to a template file. So if you ever wanted to transfer your um, Power Query queries from one workbook to another, it has been possible with some very, very hard to find functionality. This new export template option allows you to export your Power Query queries to a template file, and then you can import them very easily, not just in Excel, but in other places in Power Query too. And I'll show you that in a moment. But before we move on from Excel, um, I'm going to close this. This was Excel Desktop. I want to show you what's new in Excel Online. Now, I'm going to open up a new workbook here in Excel on the desktop. And what I've got here is a very simple Power Query query that doesn't connect to any data, but when I refresh it, will return the current system date and time. So this is the date and time from the last time that I ran the refresh. If I refresh this query again, you can see that it's 20 past two in the afternoon here in the UK. And there's my Power Query query. This is Excel on the desktop. So not really very exciting. But if I close this and we go to a browser, this is the same OneDrive folder. This is the same Excel file that I was showing you just now. If I open this here in the browser, I can now go to look at this. I can go to data. I can open up the queries and connections pane. So I can see all of my Power Query queries 
And what's more, I can refresh the Power Query queries here in Excel online. Well, this one will refresh. And right now, what you'll be able to do is refresh Power Query queries that can connect to any data source that you can connect to without authentication, which is very limited. But coming pretty soon in the next few months, you will be able to connect to Power refresh Power Query queries in the browser in Excel online that connects to at least some data sources that require authentication. So this not only means that you'll be able to manually refresh your Power Query queries in Excel online and be able to do Power Query stuff in the browser, but this is then the starting point for being able to refresh Power Query queries programmatically. You know, in the future, you should be able to use Office scripts to refresh your Power Query queries and automate those Office scripts, for example, using Power Automate. And that will be incredibly useful. All right, so that's it for Power Query in Excel. Let's move on to Dataflows Gen 2. Now, if you've used Power BI, you will probably know what data flows are. Data flows are the simple self-service ETL tool for citizen developers. With Fabric, we have a new type of data flow, which is a data flow Gen 2. And data flows Gen 2 have some quite important new functionality in it, in them. And of course, that's all Power Query functionality. We can use template files. We've got quite an important change to storage. We can use new staging options. Uh, we can use Copilot, for example. So let's see an example of this. Here is a workspace, and I'm just going to open up a Dataflow Gen 2 that I created early, earlier, but it's going to have nothing in it. It's going to be completely empty. First thing to notice, remember we were talking about template files in Excel? Well, I can export to a template file here, but I can also import from a template file as well. So if I want to import that Power Query query that gave me the current date and time, I can click on import from the Power Query template click on the PQT file that contains the current, the, that particular query, click open. And there we are. There's that same Power Query query exported from Excel and run in the browser in a Dataflow Gen 2. So that's pretty useful. If I delete that, I am then going to go in and connects to those same two the Excel tables that we saw before. I'm going to go to Excel workbook. Another interesting new feature here is that I can not only link to a file, but I can upload a file and in fact store it inside the Power Query query. So I'm going to go to upload file, click browse, connect to demo data. This uploads the file. This is a good way of doing kind of quick and dirty um, analysis of data. Click next. Select those same two tables that we had before. And what we've got here is you know, the diagram view, the script view, all of those things that we saw in Power BI Desktop in that preview that I showed you. But this is just regular. Um, Dataflows Gen 2. If you're using Dataflows Gen 2 today, this is what you've got. A few interesting things to point out here. There are, at the moment, you'll look at this and think, well, it looks basically the same as Dataflows Gen 1. But there are a couple of really, really important differences. First of all, Dataflows Gen 1 were actually two things. They were a self-service ETL tool and they were some storage. So when you refreshed your data flow, the output of the data flow was stored in some storage that Power BI managed, which you couldn't get access to. 
However, now with Dataflows Gen 2, you only have the ETL tool. There is no storage, which seems a bit of a step back. But the good news is you can now control where a data flow loads data to. So you've got these destinations. If I click here, you can see that you can load data to an Azure SQL database. You can load data to Azure Data Explorer. And you've got two fabric destinations. So remember, if you're using Dataflows Gen 2, you've got fabric turned on in your Power BI tenant, which means that you can use lake houses or warehouses. And if I click on lake house, I can click next. And I'm going to go to the workspace that I'm in. I'm going to load data to a new lake house called what's new in PQ. It's going to create a new table. I could choose an existing table if I wanted. Click next. And there's something else interesting here as well, which I think is quite exciting. Let me get to the next screen. So this is where I can see the columns where I'm going to be loading data in. At the moment, it's all being treated as text. But if I turn off these automatic settings, this is where you can see some quite interesting new options. First of all, most importantly, the default behavior of the data flow when you refreshed it was to delete all of the existing data and overwrite it. You now have the option, however, to append to existing data. So this means that you can now refresh your data flow. It will load data into your destination. And then the next time you refresh the data flow, you can append new data onto that data flow rather than replacing what was already there. This is a fairly crude thing. Um, this is not as sophisticated as incremental refresh. Incremental refresh for data flows Gen 2 is coming. I was testing an internal early version of it um, just yesterday, so it is being worked on. Um, but you know, if you just simply want that really basic functionality of running the data flow and appending, you've got that there as well. You've also got some functionality here for what happens when your schema changes. So with a dynamic schema, you can handle dynamic uh, changes to the schema. But this is at the risk of dropping a table and recreating it. With a fixed schema, you can say, my schema is never going to change. And that gives you some performance improvements, as well as you know, insulating you from any accident, accidental um, schema changes. So I'm going to cancel out of that, not create a destination. Something else that is important is that we've got a kind of improvement of what we called the enhanced compute engine in Dataflows Gen 1. So I'm going to close this and exit it and open up another query here. So it doesn't matter too much about what the data is here, but at the moment, you can see with this query, I'm loading this data to a lake house. You can see it's going to a lake house down here, but you can see it's in italics. Now, in old school Power Query, this would mean that the query wasn't being loaded, um, but this has kind of changed. If I right click on this, I've got this option here to enable staging. So staging is a really important thing to understand with Dataflows Gen 2. With staging, what you can do is copy the raw data from the source into, actually, that, that's wrong. You, what you can do with staging is take the output of a Power Query query and then stage it inside Fabric before it gets loaded onto your source or before any future queries upstream access it. So for example, if I was to go to price paid here and reference this Power Query query 
and start doing some transformations. At the moment, any transformations I do in this new query that I've created are just say, simply going to be treated as you know, extra, cal extra transformations on top of what's happening in price paid. Now, if the transformations in price paid and this new query fold, they will all go back to the data. All of those transformations will be pushed back to the data source. But if they don't, well, things could be a little bit slow. So if I was to enable staging here by right clicking and choosing enable staging, then when I refresh this data flow, the output of price paid would actually be stored in some fabric storage sitting behind the scenes. In fact, a fabric warehouse. And then any transformations that I do here would work on the data that has been staged inside fabric. Now, staging is quite dangerous um, because it can slow things down quite a lot. Um, we're working on some intelligent defaults for staging, um, but it is definitely worth experimenting with staging to see whether you can improve the performance of your data flows Gen 2. If you find that staging is turned on, try turning it off. And if you find that staging is turned off, try turning it on if you're doing this type of referencing of query. So you can see some really big changes, but generally speaking, I would say staging is only going to give you performance improvements if you're working with quite large amounts of data, at least a million rows. You're getting data from a fairly um, simple data source that doesn't support query folding, maybe like a text file, and you want to do some quite complex transformations where it actually makes sense to take the time to load the data into Fabric before any transformations take place afterwards. So we've got staging. We've also got another optimization that's visible here, which is fast copy. Now, if you're connecting to certain types of data source, Dataflows Gen 2 can now use something called fast copy, which allows it to load data and do some simple transformations on that data before the data gets staged in Fabric. To use fast copy, you're going to have to turn it on. So you need to go to options, scale, and allow use of fast copy connectors. And then, like I said, you've got to make sure that you fulfill all the rules. You can't do certain things. You can't connect certain types of sources and expect fast copy to work. The question is then, well, which sources are, su are supported? Um, Azure Data Lake Gen, Gen 2 Storage Azure D uh, and a few others are supported. Um, and there are certain transformations which are supported, like you know simple combined files operations. But it can be quite confusing to know whether uh, fast copy is happening. Um, if you do want to know, however, you can actually have a look on the query folding indicators. And here you can see that there is a message that says one or more steps in my query is not supported by fast copy. So even though I've got it turned on, this query won't benefit from it. But if I go to this query, which connects to a table in a fabric lake house, it's thinking about it. You can see on the tooltip here that this step will be evaluated by fast copy. A few other things to show with Dataflows Gen 2. I can close the Dataflow Gen 2. Uh, I can also close it and rather than publishing now and waiting for a minute or so for it to publish, I can click publish later, which can save me some time. I'm going to close without saving. I can then also refresh. So I'm going to refresh this. You can see it's refreshing, but the cool thing is now I can cancel the refresh as well. So I'm going to cancel the refresh. One last thing to show. I shouldn't have uh, closed my Power Query queries here, but luckily they're still here. We've now got Copilot in Dataflows Gen 2. So Copilot in Dataflows Gen 2 generates M code. 
So it can do a number of different things. It can create brand new queries. It can create new steps in existing queries. And it can also explain what's going on inside your query. So as a quick example of this, let me show you a, a really simple prompt. Here's my table of data. And let's say that I only wanted to get the rows in this table for products that were produced in France. If I enter the prompt here in the Copilot play, say filter the table so I only have products that were produced in the country France, and I click here, There you are. You can see it's added a new step to my query, filtering the rows. And if we look at the M code, uh, let's look at the step script. You can see that it has successfully filtered on producer country equals France. So it creates new queries. It can create new steps. It will also explain your M code. So. If you're somebody who's coming in and trying to understand somebody else's code, I can say, tell me what this query does. And it will actually explain every single step in the query and tell you what it's done, which I think is pretty cool. All right. Let's. Close that. Very quickly, I'm going to show you a, a few other things that have happened um, that are available now in Dataflows Gen 2 and indeed in Power BI Desktop. We've got a couple of new connectors. Um, there are connectors being added all the time. A lot of them are not really very exciting if you're not interested in the particular data source. There is one interesting new connector, which is, I think, relevant for a lot more people. Everybody now is talking about Delta as a format. Um, Fabric uses Delta as its default storage format. Databricks are obviously very, very big on Delta. We actually have a now have now got a, a native Delta connector and indeed a connector for Parquet files in Power Query. So if I was to go to here, I've got a connection to a folder stored in Azure Data Lake Gen 2 storage. And I can use the new delta lake.table to connect to ADLS Gen 2 storage and say what's in this folder is actually a delta table. I can get the data out like that. I've also got a Parquet connector. So if I've got a Parquet file, I can connect to a Parquet file as well. The interesting thing about the Delta table is that Delta as a format stores history. So if you make changes to your data, it actually stores that history, all of those changes. And the Delta connector has the ability to see all of the different versions of your data. So using this value.versions function, if we look at the full code, what I'm doing here is taking the output of that Delta demo query using value.versions. And this will give me the four different version numbers that are available for this Delta table. So I can actually do time travel in Power Query now, which is pretty cool. All right. Let's move away from that. One very one other interesting thing to mention, which I won't dwell on. Um, I'm in the middle of writing a blog post on on, on something like this, but um, it hasn't ever been possible to see the memory and CPU usage for Power Query queries easily. Um, you can do that now in Log Analytics and in Fabric. If you ever want to see the um, the memory or the CPU used by a Power Query query associated with a Power BI semantic model, you can do that 
in profiler or log analytics either by looking at a command end event and at the end of the XMLA for, for example, a refresh command, you will see the memory used by that refresh command plus the CPU and memory used by the Power Query engine. So this is something I, I wrote a blog post on last Sunday. Um, there's another blog post that I need to write talking about what these actually mean and what actually you can do inside Power Query to cause big memory spikes and perhaps cause errors. Um, there's also a new event. There's a bug in Profiler that means it's not showing up here, but there's a new event called Execution Metrics, which gives you the same information in a slightly easier to consume form. So you can see the M engine CPU time and M engine peak memory here for the execution metrics event, plus a whole bunch of other really interesting things as well, including like the number of rows returned by your Power Query query. All right. I have left the most exciting thing though until last. If you're a Power Query fan, you like using Power Query in new places, and there is a new place to use Power Query. We now have Power Query built into Report Builder, which means that Power BI paginated reports can now connect to everything that Power Query can connect to. And you can use Power Query to transform your data and use that inside a paginated report. So this means you can connect to web services and paginated reports, Snowflake, BigQuery, loads of other different sources, and you can do all of those Power Query transformations that you know and love, which I think is really, really useful. So I'm going to open up Power BI Report Builder. and I'm going to create a pagination report. And I would say while well, this is opening up, I would say the really exciting thing about this is that if you've been using Excel and Power Query to do reporting, and you've sometimes got a little bit frustrated about not being able to refresh your Power Query queries in Excel, what this allows you to do is take exactly the same Power Query queries, create a paginated report, which means that you can now get exactly the same tables of data in a report inside Power BI using all the same Power Query logic. You can refresh that on a schedule and you can now export that to a number of different sources, including an Excel workbook. Let's see this new experience in action. So this is Report Builder. I'm going to create a new blank report. And here we are, it's my blank report. I'm going to call this sales report. And I need to connect to some data sources. So I'm going to go to data. And you can see here is the new Power Query data source, get data. So click on this. And here are all of the Power Query data sources that I can now connect to with a paginated report. I, however, I'm going to carry on using the Excel file that we were looking at earlier. So if we go back to here and go back to what's new in Power Query, here's my demo data data. So this is the Excel file we've been using all the way through. There's the table of data. If I connect to this Excel file using the web connector here, I'm going to connect this up. Connection's already been authenticated, so it's recognized. I'm going to click Connect. Next. And let's get our sales table. And then you can see here all of our sales. I can transform data. Here's the Power Query experience we know and love. Not going to do any transformations. I'm just going to click Create here. 
click OK. And now if I insert a table, there we go, insert table and drag and drop the three columns from there. Uh, and let's make that bold. I can now run my report. And every time I run the report, the Power Query query will run, it'll go back to Excel, and it will get that table of data. Now, what's the difference between this and Power BI? Because you can use Excel files in Power BI. In a regular Power BI report, in a regular semantic model, you need to refresh the semantic model to get any changes. With a paginated report, there is no semantic model, at least not in this case, which means that every time the data changes, if I refresh the report, the Power Query query will run and it will get the new data. So what this means is if I get, let's say, um, guavas from Turkey and sales is a thousand. I've updated my Excel workbook. I need to close it to make sure the Excel workbook saves. But now if I click refresh, the Power Query query is going to run again. And there we are. The data appears immediately inside my paginated report. I could parameterize this report, um, pass parameters in, do everything that I do with Power Query. But I think this on its own is really, really interesting to anybody who's been using Power Query to do reporting in Excel because paginated reports, you can run them on a schedule, you can export to PDF, you can export to Excel workbooks, you can view them in the browser. They you know, maybe are a little bit old school in some respects, but they do what they do. And in a lot of cases, you just want a table of data and simple, some simple graphs and charts on a report that somebody can export or print out or something like that. All right, that's the end of my presentation. Um, and I've got 10 minutes left to answer any questions that anybody has. Hey, please do not hesitate. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for, for, your, inform, uh, for your sharings, uh, Chris. Many of them are great features. How, how about the, those switches? Are they coming to the Pro License as well? Not not only to Gen two. Uh, no, the the data flow stuff that's only going to be there in Gen two, mm. because the destinations are fab. They're all mostly fabric destinations. So this is functionality that will only be there in data flows Gen two. Yeah, Mario, your shoes. Uh, it would be great to have destinations in uh, Dataflow Gen 1, 2 as well. <laughs> it's a great feature. Yeah. Okay, uh, please unmute yourself if you have questions. Thank you, Donald. In the meantime, I can ask one personal question. Uh, mm -hmm. If I use data flow with CDM folders, mm -hmm. the first header disappears. It says column one, two, three, up to something. Is this mm -hmm. behavior, uh, is that behavior uh, sorry, expected? Uh, yeah. Um, I don't think it is. Um, it sounds like it might be a bug. So I I would say you should probably open a support case to get that looked at. Um, okay. But no, it, it, it's been a while since I've looked at um, used CDM folders as a source. Well, I tried to play with JSON file. Uh, there are some <laughs> settings there, but I'm not able to fix it. Good to hear that. When can we expect this change? Uh, which change? Sorry, the the unfolded column names. 
uh, I don't know if you I if you don't open a support case, nobody will know about it and it won't get fixed. So I think you'll need to check it, make sure it's not a bug. And if it is a bug, somebody will have to go around and fix it. OK, thank you. I would always say if you see something weird that you think is a bug, report it, because if you don't and you don't open a support case, um, it might never get fixed. OK, thank you. Any question from the audience? Please don't no. be shy. Hi, I'm never shy. Well, sometimes. <laughs> hey, two two questions. One may be quick. Uh, Chris, as far as you know, is there like a built in hash function in Power Query? If there is, I've never really found one. So if you no, want to like, isn't. yeah, you'd have to roll your own or something. Yeah, and I'm almost certain I've seen people um, build hash functions in Power Query. Yeah. Then. Okay. Um, I I would have to have a quick search for it, but I'm yeah, that's fine. I've but... seen one. Okay. And then the second question, I guess, with the data flows, a lot of people seem to have reservations on performance, say, compared to doing the same sort of thing in Spark Notebooks. And I'm assuming it's just one of those things that will probably get better, and it probably depends on the circumstance, the amount of data, et cetera. But it sounds like with things like fast cap copy, that's one thing. You know, that that's obviously a big obvious one. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have anything else to comment on that as far as maybe when to use data flows versus the notebooks or um, as far as performance and cost, especially? Yeah, I mean, I think data flows Gen 2, we are improving the performance. Um, one of the big things that you can do apart from fast copy is disable staging. That That's the easiest thing that I think I've found. Um, just a lot of the time when people are complaining about poor performance, you can improve performance by just disabling staging. Yeah. Um, for better or worse, it's on by default for everything now. If you turn it off, you can at least see what the performance difference yeah, is. And you know, that's usually going to improve things. I haven't been in Fabric too much. I was in it a couple of weeks ago. It did seem to notice that it had turned it off by default on some queries oh, okay. I was doing. Possibly, so maybe they're yeah. doing something where it kind of, hey, it's a small table and we're going to turn it on for you. And if so, that's a good thing to, you know, probably do that and let people turn it on when they really need to. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot for your question, Donald. Any other question? Your last chances. <clears throat> okay, then let me stop the recording.